Hello everyone and welcome to theCUBE's live coverage of Cloudera Evolve 24. We are live in New York City. I'm your host, Rebecca Knight, sitting alongside my co-host and analyst, Bob LaLiberté. Bob, we're just kicking things off here in New York and it's, it's going to be a great day. Absolutely, really looking forward to it. Went through the keynotes this morning. A lot of excitement there, a lot of buzz going on, a lot of announcements, so looking to unpack that over the course of the day. And who better to unpack that with than the CEO of Cloudera, Charles Sansbury. Thank you so much for coming on theCUBE. Well, thank you so much for having me. So, it's been about a year. You're nearing your one year anniversary in the CEO shoes. I know it's been quite a year. Uh, you have crisscrossed the globe three times in the past nine weeks, so yes. you must be exhausted. So we, you have our condolences, but you're settling into the new role. Fill us in, catch us up. What's been going on? Sure, um, and I'm fully caffeinated, so the good <laughs> news right, is good I'm, I'm getting through good it. Good to hear. Uh, you know, I, I joined literally uh, a, a year and a couple of weeks ago, and, and when I joined, ChatGPT had just been announced. The volume around AI was starting to increase, and, and I joined Cloudera because of a couple of things. Um, one, we had great customers in great markets. So the view, I've always had a view, we've always had a view that data and analytics was going to be key to companies' data strategies to help them make better business decisions. And we count as our customers literally the global leaders in every industry. So that was a great foundation on which to build. Um, also, we're global in scale, and that means we've got people all over the world, uh, you know, more than a billion dollars in revenue, uh, about 3,000 people. What that means is we can serve global companies in the time zone, in the language that they want, which is a requirement to serve that global group. And then thirdly, um, a group of, of aligned and supportive investors, which means that you know, we have a market that's very dynamic and a lot of competitive intensity. That means that investment is critical for us to not just maintain our leadership position, but extend it. So in the company, I found uh, a combination of that product leadership, great markets, a really strong team and supportive investors, since I've joined, um, AI has become the absolute topic. You know, we've been doing what used to be called machine learning based models for customers for 10 years. As compute has gotten faster and access to data has gotten greater, machine learning has kind of evolved into what we call AI today. Um, but it kind of moved to one of our strengths. So the biggest, uh, I'd say the reasons I joined have been not just a firm, but actually uh, what we do is even more important one of the key things that I think we've done in the last 12 months is really to get aligned and prioritized around three things, and they're all driven by customer requirements. Um, thing one is we enable companies to manage their workloads, their computing jobs, across all three of the important computing platforms. Public cloud, private cloud, as well as on-premise. We're the only company that can do that. That's a critical capability for large global organizations who basically want the ability to match a specific computing job to the appropriate workload based on its compute requirements, security requirements, and the like. Um, the second thing is we're a leader in adopting and bringing to market what we call modern data architectures, but that's really the concept of the open data lake house, where you're bringing data from all over your organization from different silos into one common data pool, and then basically making that pool available to analytics engines to both train uh, and, 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 and empower uh, these AI models. And then thirdly, we're doing a lot to help our customers operationalize or bring AI to their businesses. We are not building large language models, that is not what we do, but we are providing the infrastructure and capabilities to make data available and appropriately structured to feed and train models, and then we're helping customers evaluate the performance of those models and deploy those models, which is a critical part of the kind of ecosystem in helping companies realize AI. So it's a pretty exciting time to be here. Indeed. Yeah, absolutely, that sounds great. One of the things that I like during your keynote was you outlined the history mm -hmm. of the, the organization. And what was really impressive was over the last several years, there's been a lot of transformation, a lot of innovation mm -hmm. that you're bringing to market to the organization to help with those AI projects, to help with the data management strategy. I'm wondering if you want to have an opportunity here to just message who is Cloudera today sure. and what would you want people to take away from this event? Sure. Well, uh, I think it's clear from the, the content you've seen in the main stage, the customers that are here today, we are de facto the leading data and analytics platform across hybrid environments for the world's largest companies. And those are the companies that are driving the most business value out of their data. And it's very data specific and data intensive industries like financial services, telecommunications companies, healthcare and pharmaceutical research companies. Those are companies for whom getting business learning out of the data and then getting actionable decision from that business, from that, from that quantitative learning 
is critical to making their businesses better, and, and we have hundreds of customers worldwide who are already doing that today. Uh, one, of my, one of my observations is Cloudera is actually a well-kept secret in the sense that our customers know this, but we're using events like this to broadcast it to a broader audience. So very excited to be here and very excited about the future for Cloudera. Well, so I, that was a really fascinating part of your keynote where you talked about how today the enterprise runs on Cloudera. It's nine of the 10 top global insurers, eight of the 10 top global automakers, mm -hmm. three of the four largest credit card companies are using Cloudera. And as you just said, are, 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 you're learning from them and mm -hmm. they're learning from each other. So this is an event where you are letting the secret out of the bag. People mm -hmm. are now, mm -hmm. now knowing what you're all about. This is a premier gathering that brings together people from industry, innovators, enthusiasts, enthusiasts to learn more about it. What in your mind makes this event so unique? Um, well, I think there, there are a number of things that I really like about the event. The primary one I like though is that when we do these events, we try to make them customer driven. Customers take their time and pay money to come here and want to be educational. Um, we also are a little bit selfish. We want to take time to educate them on the new things that we've done and how our technology's evolved. So the customer-driven aspect of this event um, is that customers will do most of the presentations. They'll be talking about how they're using the technology uh, to run their customer support better, to deliver better offers to their customers, to analyze their operations, improve manufacturing processes. It's not one of our people up there talking about roadmaps and what our products might do, it's what our products are actually doing in production. The second thing is that it's a very interesting kind of peer-based forum where customers want to hear from other customers what they're doing, what's worked and what's not. And so some of the most interesting conversations are ones that happen kind of in, in the breakout rooms where, where people from different industries uh, who may have similar problems, that problem being you know, anomaly detection. Um, anomaly detection for a manufacturing company is uh, identifying either manufacturing process problems uh, or, or looking at product failures and tracking that back to a process. Anomaly detection for a financial services firm could be you know, looking at fraud transactions and what they look like, but there's some common themes and use cases. One of the things that we've been able to do because we do these types of projects for hundreds of customers is to kind of abstract back those customer use cases to a set of common principles and then provide to our customers kind of a a reference architecture, and it's not a 20-page document, it's a two-page document of here was the business problem, here's the technology solution that went and solved it, and, and that's been very valuable in helping people get started in thinking about once you've gone through the work of getting your data estate into shape and prepared to support your analytics initiatives, where do you start? What are the applications where people have seen quick wins, early returns on investment? Because one of the other things that I'm hearing in this global tour, um, I heard every customer talk about the importance of AI and investing aggressively for it. And then I heard, but the folks who approve my investment, my board of directors, my investors, they want to return quickly. And so we're building this infrastructure or foundation, but what are the quick wins that we can get in terms of, of applications or use cases that people have shown to be business improvement generators very quickly? And I think we're a pretty important part of the ecosystem in establishing what those use cases are and then broadcasting it to customers how they can get those quick wins. And as you pointed out, that so many of the learnings, whether it's from manufacturing or from, from fraud detection, a lot of them are broadly applicable. Yes. Um, but speaking of, you have just announced some news recently with NVIDIA yes. um, to accelerate Gen AI deployment yes. and development. Tell us more a little bit about this, this announcement a couple days ago. Well, so um, NVIDIA is a, a a chip startup that had a focus on uh, video games and then they found, I'm, I'm being a little bit. <laughs> yes, I, I mean, exactly, <laughs> we got uh, you. Yeah. <laughs> so, this is a safe place, yeah, Charles. So, so <laughs> as you know, um, the importance of accelerated compute and the ability to basically at, at scale, at speed, analyze huge quantities of data is absolutely foundational uh, to AI-based initiatives. We've been working uh, with, with NVIDIA since before I got here for several years on certain software optimization and hardware performance op optimization initiatives. As customers are moving um, to deploy generative AI at the enterprise level, um, a couple things have happened. One, I think the cost of, of running that computer's gotten very expensive because of the increased demand for electricity, um, some of the external factors, and so NVIDIA spent a lot of time trying to basically 
improved performance and they've made incredible results reduce energy consumption, also incredible results. But the second piece of that is optimizing software so that we're optimizing the both speed and consumption of those, of those queries. And in working with them for quite a period of time, collectively I think we've developed a solution that's going to be really important. The other thing that I will tell you is um, from what we've seen, generative AI at scale will be deployed by the world's largest companies on on-premises hardware. Uh, because of cost, because of manageability, because of security issues. They effectively are going to bring those large language models to the data, as opposed to moving the data to the models. And what that means is those companies are going to have to have their own compute, and they want to be able to use it in the most efficient way. So by going to market together, again, to the world's largest companies and providing them with a solution, uh, we think it's an important investment for companies' rapid and efficient adoption of AI, and, and we're excited about the partnership. And obviously, if you're picking partners in AI, um, they're probably at the top of your partner list. Absolutely. Yeah, absolutely. We've seen that all throughout the spring and the summer. Everyone's looking to partner with NVIDIA. That's who organizations want to deploy to accelerate. But you're absolutely right about how do you, once you make those investments, how do you then optimize them? And having that data strategy in place, having that data management in place that allows you to yes. take advantage of all that data is really going to what's going to help you. As we talked about earlier, some of the speakers this morning talked about getting beyond that 85% Efficacy to 95 or 100 percent, right? Right. Leveraging those the on-premises data, the yes. secure data to get through those small language models and the action, you know, SAMs, SLMs, etc. That yes. you need to have. So that's uh, that's all fantastic. Um, one of the things I want to touch base with you on, you made a comment about your supportive investors, mm -hmm. and I think that's something I just want to touch upon because it, it really strikes maybe a different model for PE firms, right? Where mm -hmm. they're actually investing in the R and D, making those investments to help drive and be focused on the customer. I wonder if you could comment on that for a minute. Yeah, so in my, um, in my career I've worked for public companies uh, and I've worked for a number of private companies as well. Uh, so I've been subject to what I call the tyranny of the 25 year old public company <laughs> software <laughs> analyst. Um, it, my, that doesn't my, sound very fun. No, it doesn't. <laughs> and, for all the, and I have a son who's 25, so I apologize. But honestly, he was a former analyst as well, so he knows exactly what I'm talking <laughs> about. Uh, but, but the point is that um, there's a longer term focus that is necessary in, in markets like ours that have competitive intensity, have long term investment horizons and requirements in order to deliver on customer requirements. Um, and, and I think the two investors that we're working with, uh, they're investors that I've known and worked with for 10 and 20 years respectively. A and I think collectively, we and the teams have developed a shorthand uh, around understanding which investments are important for long-term term strength of the business. Um, our investors have been really uh, supportive of those investments that create long-term differentiation, even if you know, the payoff for those investments might not be until a good time in the future. Whereas for a public company, if, if we had some of those discussions, the answer would be, well, what's in it for me next quarter? Right. And so there's a longer term investment horizon, a thoughtfulness around um, growing the value of the business, building a great software company, and, and there's strong alignment. The other thing that I think is interesting is as it relates to Cloudera, um, we are aligned with the investors as well in that there's a, there's a, a, a program and a mandate we have that basically every employee uh, of Cloudera owns equity that does align with the sponsor's equity. So it's not just good for us kind of from a, from a business and from a go-to-market perspective. We're aligned kind of at, at the base investment level as well. And again, I talk about the importance of having alignment in a business. Right. That's true of strategic, that's true of operational, but that's true of also financial goals. And yeah. so I think that that's an important part of the structure we put in place with the combination of uh, KKR and Clayton Duvalier. Talking about the growing importance of AI in the workplace, you talked about it in the keynote as well as Ray Wong, one of the keynote speakers, the importance of a human in the loop. Yes. Not always, not always, because there are some times when the algorithms do make better right. decisions right. And, and more consistently than humans. But there are, of course, many instances when we need that human judgment yes. to, to intervene. So how do you see this, this, this tension and, and how do you talk about it with customers and help them figure out the balance of when you when you when you put that human into the data driven decision making? You know, I say it's it's a great question, and the, and the challenge I think is as we're creating these algorithms, 
and as we've all seen, you know, a history of Terminator movies, <laughs> um, we worry about having kind of autonomous algorithms making decisions, and it's different for different things, right? So identifying uh, anomalous patterns in securities trades, that can be left to the algorithm. Uh, manufacturing defects, okay. But as we get to things like healthcare, um, which is, you know, in some cases, a, a resource to be allocated across a, a population, that becomes a lot more sensitive. So I think there are certain use cases and places where yes, the algorithms can make the, the, the decision, but others where they can provide a framework of outcomes, but you want human interaction somewhere in that decision make, making cycle. And I think the art is going to be the appropriate time in which to insert that human decision making. Um, and I think an example like healthcare related decisions are, are ones that make clear that in some cases you want the human involved sooner versus later. We are, um, we are so early on in understanding the implications of AI and the types of decision making power that it will have that I, I just want us to be careful in thinking about or maintaining that view that at some point we want to have human interaction involved. Um, and I think generally that's a, that's a pretty well accepted view at this point with healthcare being the most obvious use case. Got it, yeah, no, that makes, that makes a lot of sense and it's always great to get the feedback of the humans as well, right? When you interject, mm -hmm. when you get that, that feedback. Which brings me to another question I had for you from a kind of cultural perspective. Mm -hmm. When you go into these organizations, everyone's trying to figure out a data strategy. How do you leverage the expertise that you have within your organization mm -hmm. to help guide organizations, either from a services, I've seen some of the accelerated uh, products that you've come out with yes. to help them rapidly yes. adopt the, the AI technology. What else are you doing to help organizations accelerate their time to value with, yep. with AI? Well, we, we sit in an interesting position because you know, we have customers that have thousands of software developers internally, hundreds or in some cases thousands of data scientists, and they're thinking every day about how to solve business problems using data and analytics, and we're, we're a part of that process in, in helping them with that and seeing what they do. We have other customers that may have a dozen or 50 or, or not as much of a focus on, on data science. What we've been able to do is look at what our, our really forward-thinking customers have done uh, around analytics, uh, in many cases around things like customer support or code generation or, um, you know, or, or even commercial opportunities like I have a customer that owns multiple products from my company, what's the next thing I should sell them based on patterns I see in other customers? Other companies don't have that kind of, that, that kind of reservoir of data science talent and increasing those folks are harder and harder to find train and hire, and so we're able to kind of abstract away the specific company and create a, a, a generic use case which is very useful to these customers that don't have uh, several rooms full of data scientists to get them started more quickly. And then as you said, we're providing also software tools and kind of quick start packages, uh, which we call advanced machine learning prototypes, yep. that allow people to get to value quicker on some of these initial use cases, again, around things like automating customer support, automating content generation. If you're a large organization, you've got a building full of file cabinets full of legal documents, but you have those digitized, you know, you can very quickly apply uh, a data mesh framework to that right. and get to a point where you're generating legal documents, uh, drafts of legal documents very quickly. The time saving and cost savings of that is astronomical. So again, there are some very quick wins, but the more important generalized point is we can help customers see the value quicker by getting them a use case that they can start to build on. Right. And then that helps, obviously, the board who are looking for the ROI. Yes. So you can help guide them down. These are the ones that will help you get there the fastest. Exactly, Perfect. exactly. Yeah. So you're just about, you're, you're, you're starting your year two as CEO. We're here at Cloudera 24. What do you want to be talking about next year at Cloudera yep. 25? What do you want to look back on and say we did? Well, it's actually you know, something that we kind of just talked about. So uh, this past year, I think, was around building out a lot of technology foundation and framework enhancements, some of the things we've announced over the last couple of days. Um, but we're also bringing a much more business value-centric perspective to the market. And historically, the data and analytics markets have been, have been run by data and analytics people. And so it was about the speeds and the feeds and the like. And increasingly the business user is becoming a critical component of, of, of implementing and adopting these applications that we help, help power. 
And so if we look back and say that we've also kind of accelerated the business use case adoption across our customer base, that will be success. Because I think this past year was a, a point about kind of getting the data foundation in place. Hopefully the next 12 months will be about driving immediate business value for our customers. And I think we're doing the right things with events like this to kind of plant the seeds of that, of that, of that effort. Excellent. Well, Charles, thank you so much for coming on theCUBE. A real pleasure having you on. Thank you all for having me. We appreciate the time as well. I'm Rebecca Knight for Bob La Liberté. Keep it right here on theCUBE for more of our live coverage of Cloudera 24. You're watching theCUBE, the leader in enterprise tech news and analysis. analysis.